chairman of the House Freedom Caucus. Thank you for being here tonight. 
It was two years ago tonight. I looked on the calendar. It was actually two, somebody brought that up to me tonight. I think it was Robert and and uh, Lynn who told me that. But but I saw that in the calendar today. It was actually literally two years ago tonight that we were in Rice, Virginia, another venue, and we did our campaign launch with General Scott Perry, who was then the new chairman of the House Freedom Caucus. And we had a great crowd just like this kicking off our campaign two years ago. And as Tom said, it's a little similar to how it was two years ago. There's some people who don't want me in Washington. There's some people who will spend a lot of money to try to buy this seat and try to keep me from going back to Washington. But I trust the people of the 5th District. You know, I'm not entitled to nomination. I'm not entitled to be your representative. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the people of the 5th District. It belongs to the history of our nation, this most historic of districts, as Tom Garrett so eloquently said. And I trust the people of the 5th District to stand up and say, this seat is not for sale. We're not going to let money from D.C. and California choose this seat. The people of the 5th District are going to choose this seat. Socialist, communist agenda, they'll even lose an election to do it. 
And we're always talking about fighting tomorrow, fighting next time. And you know what? Tomorrow and next time never seems to get here. And what I tell my colleagues in Washington, the way to expanding the majority is to be bold and courageous and strong and uncompromising and unapologetic so that you'll be inspired to knock the doors and to make the phone calls and to put up the signs and to recruit, to support the candidates and to give up your resources because you know somebody's actually fighting for you and doing what they said they would do. The fact is, we're facing existential threats in this country like we've never seen before. We're hanging on by a thread. We're teetering on the edge. We could name, I bet we could come up with easily 10, 12 crises, existential threats or internal threats. Internal threats or external existential threats to our very way of life. What the, the essence of what America is, that any one of which are just terrible threats to our country. And there's so many of those. The border invasion, some 10 million helped across the border by this president's policy intentionally. I feel like I talk about the border all the time, but we don't talk about it enough. <laughs> Is this the border program? We have said that's the hill to die on is what our leadership has said. We've tried to take tie to the spending value, trying to use the leverage of the spending value. I pledge not to fund the government that continues to facilitate this border invasion. And our leadership has said that's the hill to die on. And I said, what are you prepared to do to do it? What are you prepared to do to do it? The spending, we've never had $34 trillion in national debt, $200 billion monthly deficit, 40 year high inflation, 20 year high interest rates. The American people are suffering because of the spending. The days of spending without consequence are over. But what are we prepared to do about it? And I can tell you what is not the answer to join hands with the Democrats to pass out of the House when we have a majority. What we know the Senate will take and the President will sign, the one we just passed two weeks ago, the Democrats voted for it 207 to 2. Republicans voted for it 107 to 106. And I can tell you, there's, that was a high watermark. And I want to give you hope and encouragement with this. Getting it to 106 Republicans to buck leadership and to vote against the party. That, we went from 70 something back with the debt ceiling to 90 something with the first continued resolution. Now we're at 106, and we almost had a majority of Republicans vote against it, and they flipped a couple of votes at the very end so they can maintain the majority of the majority mentality. But don't be fooled, and I know you, you're not involved in this. Oh, we just got to get things done, no matter how bad they are. We got to show we can govern, no matter how harmful our policies. And what we're doing right now is we're keeping in place the Biden, Pelosi, Schumer policy spending levels from over a year ago when they had the majority of these continued resolutions. And I'm not going to be a party in doing that. We're doing everything we can to expose them. Even if we can't defeat it, we don't have the votes right now to do it. But I want to encourage you. We are trying to elect more conservative Freedom Caucus warriors, courageous patriots across the country. That's part of my role as the House Freedom Caucus Chairman. I'm so thankful for my colleagues entrusting me with that. You know, with, I, I knew coming into Washington, I would follow the footsteps of Tom and uh, others who were in Washington and join the House Freedom Caucus. A year in, they elected me to the board. Two years in, they elected me to the whip, which is the one who persuades the council votes or trying to take an official position on something. And then it was uh, just a very sobering uh, responsibility place to be to become the chairman. You know, I want you to know that there are warriors who are fighting on your behalf in Washington. We're trying to change the most powerful nation in the world. We're trying to change one of the two legislative bodies in the most powerful nation in the world. We're trying to undo some 60 or 70 years of this slip into the abyss on what we've done you know, as, a, as a government. There's a reason why Congress has a 20% approval rate. There's a reason for that. What we're doing there is not working. But you've got people who are willing to put country first, principle first, uh, th th their patriotism first, the Constitution first, and do what's right 
even if it is risky for them politically. You saw that on display a year ago this month with the speaker battle. And you know what, that resulted in some changes to Washington and, and the rules of how Congress operates. And it's messy, and it's not easy, and it stops and starts, but we changed the rules in Congress a year ago. We changed the rules to go back to regular order to give a voice for every member so we can make amendments from the floor. We have a bit amount of time to read legislation before it comes to the floor, 72 hours. Single issue legislation instead of all these different issues all put together in one multi-thousand page bill. Uh, regular order, working through committees, those kinds of things. We've given ourselves a fighting chance with the rule changes a year ago. Then of course, three months ago, some of us said, you know what, the speaker, former speaker has broken his word. The former speaker promised to cut spending levels to pre-COVID. Imagine that, go back to pre-COVID before we ran the month. He promised to bring a balanced budget to the floor. He promised to bring all of our 12 spending bills to the floor for a vote before September 30, which we're statute, required by statute to do. None of that happened, that's why we have a new speaker. The new speaker that we have, he's a godly man, he loves the Lord. He's a genuine conservative in his heart. He's a person of integrity. But I want you to pray for him because he's got the wrong people speaking into his ears and sometimes he's listening to the wrong people. He's got a very difficult job. He was left in a very difficult situation by the previous speaker. But we, but we need him to lead us into battle and realize that we need a wartime speaker because the enemy is real, the cause is just, and we've got to do everything that it takes in order to win this fight. <laughs> You're here because you care about the country. You're here because you know what's at stake. And I can't tell you how humbling it is to have the support of the people in the 5th District who will come out and fight and advocate and stand with us. You know, we're trying to change Congress. We're trying to change Washington. But we've also got to win back the White House. It's critical. And I want you to know that as I've said for the past Three years now. There's, there's a person who's the best president of my lifetime. Hands down, bar none. And I've said that, like you, I would enthusiastically, wholeheartedly, and support him as our nominee and do everything I can to make sure that he's elected. And it is time for all Republicans across the country, every Republican, to get behind Donald Trump, to do everything we can. Republican 